Hello, uh, Austin, and everyone watching from the internet. Uh, I'm Robert Burke, and this is the State of the Go SDK 2022. Uh, I'm a senior software engineer at Google and working on Dataflow and the Apache Beam Go SDK. Uh, I last gave a talk at, about the State of the Go SDK way back in 2020, and there's a lot of new stuff to go over since then. So uh, let's start with a small summary of what the Go SDK could do uh, before we last spoke even, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page here. Uh, previously, we started off with a bunch of the batch basics as uh, listed over here. Uh, these pieces are kind of the, form the core of Beam, and with this you can get through a lot of different batch, uh, ba uh, batch processing scenarios. It's my fault for using $3 words in my speaker notes. Uh, that second column, though, is uh, what uh, we introduced in 2020, uh, with the big features being the initial support for cross-language transforms and split up, or bounded splittable do funds. Um, and back in the faded past of summer 2020, I sent you off with this slide uh, for work that still needed doing. So with that in mind, uh, here's a summary of what's new uh, as of summer 2022. It's a lot, actually. Uh, it's not quite the same list as what I just showed. There's some things that are still missing and others are new. Uh, but I'll be going over each of the new things in this talk. But what's most important, what's absolutely critical, is what's not new. Go still has a very cute gopher mascot. So with that, let's go over the state of the Go SDK. Uh, first, the big one. Uh, in November 2021, the SDK finally exited experimental. Uh, Beam calls uh, certain features experimental uh, to underscore their kind of dynamic nature. An experimental feature of the SDK will probably work for your purposes, but it's not kind of guaranteed to be the same from release to release. Uh, this was the culmination of many pieces, uh, but the big ones were documenting the SDK in the Beam programming guide, schema support, uh, additional support for uh, Go modules, and of course, uh, those bounded splittable do funds so we could have IOs that could actually scale. Uh, since 2020 already covered bounded SDFs, uh, let's focus on those last few. Um, the Beam Programming Guide is the best place to currently get started exploring the many uh, facets of Beam, at least until the upcoming uh, Beam Playground and Tour stuff gets going later this year. Uh, but regardless, it's important that uh, all SDKs have very good coverage in the programming guide. And since experimental exit, the Go SDK is very well represented in the uh, various toggleable examples and paragraphs in the guide. You just simply select Go or Go SDK from the nearby tabs, and it will switch you into Go mode, and you'll be learning the SDK from that with the ability to compare how both uh, Java and Python do it, and in some cases, even uh, TypeScript, which is very experimental. Um, so the programming guide, I'll remind you, is a living document and focused on the latest release of Beam. So it's a good place to go to learn the fundamentals and building blocks of the various SDK features as they are at the, the, the best version of Beam currently. Um, one of the other requirements that we realized kind of later in the ex experimental exit process was uh, one of uh, coder stability. It's clear that once we left experimental, we needed to not make large incompatible changes to how data propagated around your data pipelines. Uh, and while JSON is sort of the standard for uh, slinging around data in the, the, the industries of we have in cloud, it's kind of verbose which makes it longer, take, uh, take longer and be more expensive to encode and decode. And when you're processing trillions upon trillions of uh, events and elements, uh, you don't want to spend all that time strictly in your encoder and decoder. You want to actually get some real work done. Um, so ultimately, we've changed the default struct coder uh, from JSON to uh, beam schema, the Beam Schema row encoder. If you didn't know, Beam schemas enable cross-language transforms. And since that way, all the SDKs speak a common tongue and can pass around data and interpret the data in the same way. 
uh, this allows any uh, foreign and host SDKs for cross-language pipelines to actually communicate properly, as well as further let users manipulate it on the other end. Uh, using schema encoding by default uh, will enable simpler usage of these cross-language transforms and uh, others enable uh, other schema aware transforms going forward. Uh, you can see some examples of those kinds of things in the TypeScript SDK and the Python SDK, if I recall. Um, currently, the Go SDK implements schemas implicitly. So if you're using your own struct type, the fields will become fields in the row encoder and so on recursively. So you don't need to worry about it most of the time. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, one of the other bits for exiting experimental was actually beginning to use Go modules for dependency management. Uh, as of the November 2021 uh, Beam release, which was uh, version 2.33, uh, this finally happened for the Go SDK. So Go modules uh, are basically how Go has standardized on using, doing its dependency uh, management and versioning. And they were first introduced in Go 111. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, it's like so, but that was back in, goodness, 2017 or so. It's been a little, it's been a little while since then. Uh, and it took a while for us to actually to begin adopting Go modules uh, because the moment you kind of did, uh, we were, would suddenly be very much locked into that no longer experimental state, because that's just something that's kind of expected of the Go ecosystem, especially for any packages that are well past version one, uh, which with Beam kind of on a unified version for every single release across all the languages, being on the version two plus would have been of kind of, a, and then saying this is experimental, would have been mixing signals to the, Beam, the Go community. So we decided to uh, delay until we were much closer to uh, releasing that. Um, otherwise, as kind of the slide is indicating, uh, we're also requiring the, uh, uh, the latest version of Go as of the, uh, with a, since version 240 of Beam, which only released a couple weeks ago. Uh, the latest version of Go, 118, it has several new features that we've already begun to, begun to adopt in the SDK. I'll get to how we're using those later. Uh, the only other thing to mention here is that to, because of the way we ad began to adopt uh, Go modules, uh, there is in fact a slight difference in import path that you need to be aware of. So important that it's the main topic of this slide. <laughs> Uh, if the latest version of the Go SDK that you're seeing is only version 2.32, you're on the legacy approach and need to update your import paths so that they have the V2 component into it right after SDKs and before Go. Um, and then other than that, the Go tooling should handle the rest. So it looks like I still have another 10... 15 minutes or so left, is that right? Uh, but, uh, so, but we still have plenty to cover because that's only experimental exit and that's only what three features that I went over right now. So experimental exit was fairly recent. That was November, 2021. That's like eight months ago, eight, nine months ago. But we had done so much more to solve other blockers in the meantime. So let's go over those more user facing features now. Uh, Triggers are one of those just past the basics features of Beam. They let you configure and fine tune aggregation behavior. If windows are the summary for aggregation, uh, triggers are kind of the details. They let you get the early looks at what your data is doing and like get the early sums, partial sums, and tune what you want to do with the late data. Uh, as certainly as of 233 and later, we have support, we have support for a very robust set of triggers. Uh, you can thank uh, Ritesh over in the back of the room there uh, for, for that. Uh, cross-language transforms, uh, moving on to, a, to cross-language transforms, are one of those other unique features of Beam uh, port that the uh, Beam's portability model uh, enables. Uh, because just because it's possible to do something though, it doesn't make it easy. So we're calling this out again because um, it's evolved ever since uh, 2020. Um, 
Oh, I've lost my place in my speaker notes. Right. Uh, so it, while it's a goal for Beam to have wrappers for most of the production-ready transforms that exist in other languages, it takes time to make these wrappers available and add a bunch of convenience things to them. So uh, this work is still it is like it's still early days for this work, and Go has some catching up to do. But that said, we do have additional wrappers available already in the SDK, just built in, and you can adopt them whenever you like, just using standard Go calls. Uh, specifically for Kafka, BigQuery, uh, the JDBC, so J uh, Java Database Connections, uh, Beam SQL, and a Debezium for all your change data capture needs. Uh, you can find all of those in the IO Xlang uh, sub packages. Uh, and one of the other pain points for cross language transforms, though, is that in order to make use of them, you need to have an expansion service. The expansion service is necessary so that you can actually get access to the various dependencies and get the sub-transforms that are being used in your cross-language transforms. Uh, so this use, has historically involved a manual process where you spin up one of the expansion services and then configure your pipeline when it's starting up to talk to that expansion service, uh, either through hard coding the addresses or setting up your own sets of flags. Uh, but we certainly decided that that was a little bit more of a pain in the butt than anyone really wanted, so we kind of just automated the whole thing. Uh, instead, these all those cross-language transforms I mentioned before and any future ones will automatically download the jars necessary to start up its, the expansion services, query them, and then shut the whole shebang down uh, to make it much easier to begin adoption of these uh, cross-language transforms like now and going forward. You can thank uh, Jack in the back of the room uh, for uh, setting that up. Uh, so cross languages by itself, big Beam feature, kind of the future of Beam, no matter which way you're going, is all well and good. But uh, in case you haven't noticed the theme of all my talks, I'm a little bit of a language purist myself. I like, I like just op the operational simplicity of dealing with one language. Why use two when one will do? Uh, so uh, just because we can now rely on Java's implementations isn't a good enough to reason to kind of stop adding to the Go SDK itself. So with that in mind, we kept adding. Uh, so it is my delight to tell you uh, that as of the latest release of Beam version 240, the Go SDK uh, can our users of the Go SDK can now author their own unbounded splittable do funds directly in Go. This lets you write a streaming source do fund and with all that entails, from splitting to scaling to estimating the watermarks and more. Um, for those of you with custom data services to query and poll, this is the feature for you. We have uh, the near, at this point, we nearly have the whole streaming kit. Uh, this was a large collaborative work uh, from everyone on the uh, contributing from uh, the, 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 the Beam team over at Dataflow, but especially uh, Ritesh, Danny, and Jack, also still in the back of the room there. <laughs> so thank you very much for all this hard work. Um, and if you'd like, there's actually another talk uh, tomorrow in, at uh, 4.15 in room 203 about how to write your own uh, native Go streaming pipeline, where Danny and Jack will tell you all the necessary details uh, for, for doing that. There we go. Uh, further along for smaller scale features, but still no less, or no less uh, necessary. Uh, Beam has long had integrated metrics, but the Go SDK finally has a way of accessing them, accessing them post job completion. Previously, you were kind of beholden to whatever metric store the runner would use natively. So you'd then have to figure out how to get access to the job ID and then be able to query that store directly. Uh, now we're beginning to do that for you. Uh, so after a uh, job is completed, you have access to the pipeline results object, and you can then uh, query for specific metrics. Uh, this object will 
gather more methods and get more abilities to manipulate uh, your, your metrics over time. Uh, but uh, now you can uh, program programmatically access your metrics through various beam primitives. Thanks to Ritesh for, for this feature. Uh, next up is map side input. Side inputs have a variety of different kind of modes that you can operate them in. Uh, but for the longest time, Go could only really do the iterable, uh, uh, er, well, iterators for accessing your side inputs. Um, so map side inputs let you turn your KVP collections into lookup tables for downstream do funds. Like other side inputs, this abstract uh, this is abstracted using Go uh, functions, uh, which uh, in this case is a function that returns a function. You simply uh, pass in the key, and then you'll get a function that you can uh, extract the values associated with that key from the side input. Uh, this is safer than rolling your own memory uh, cache uh, and allows you to observe windows properly uh, from those side inputs. And um, speaking of caches, uh, this leads nicely into my favorite topic, performance. We have uh, three performance-related features to mention here. Uh, one, the side input cache, then generic registration, and finally, load tests. Uh, for those of you who aren't yet familiar with the full Beam architecture, Beam abstracts your data into uh, units of processing called bundles. And when it comes to side inputs and other state, it will be inefficient to query your side input data for each element in each bundle on the same worker, uh, for every single element. Uh, for batch, this might not matter so much because they typically have much larger bundles. Uh, but for streaming, they can only be like a, they're more likely to be very small amounts of data. So if you have a global, a side input that's from a global window that you're going to use all the time, we don't want to keep transferring that back and forth between the runner half and the, uh, the, the SDK half. That would be incredibly inefficient and slow. So Beam has a feature called the state cache or side input cache, which will, uh, when enabled, uh, let uh, the, S the worker uh, cache more data on the uh, SDK side locally to the process and allow that, that, uh, that uh, data to be used uh, cross bundle, and which saves a bunch of lookups, saves a bunch of time, just at a little bit of cost of memory on the worker. Currently, the uh, cache is disabled by default in the Go SDK, uh, but you can enable it on supported runners, which I think include Flink and Dataflow, if I recall correctly, uh, for it to better fit your data uh, with uh, the harness ops package, where you can configure basically how many uh, side inputs are going to be held at most. Uh, by default, it will also, the, the, the cache is uh, set up so that it will um, uh, garbage collect uh, cache items that are not, haven't been used in some time or not in active use. Uh, thank, uh, these last two features, by the way, are thank you to Jack, who worked on both map side inputs and the side input cache. Uh, next uh, is also sort of a redux of something else I announced in 2020. Uh, in 2020, I talked about a static analysis code generator thing that you could use to improve the speed and efficiency of your Go pipelines. If you didn't know, the Go SDK uses a lot of reflection under the hood, not just a pipeline construction time, but uh, if it has no other options, it will use it at uh, execution time as well in order to invoke the arbitrary methods and functions that you're putting in as part of your do funds. Uh, but uh, since Go 1.18, uh, the latest Go release from February this year, uh, it's the first Go release to start featuring uh, type parameters. So in other words, generics. Uh, this has been a long requested feature from the Go team and by the Go community. Uh, so we wasted very little time uh, improving what we had before to make use of it. So uh, with generics, we've made using the same kind of code and performance uh, adapters that uh, the uh, old static analysis code generator could use. But now it's done all by the Go compiler itself. Uh, that means you no longer need to worry about an extra file to regenerate. It's just you make your changes, and it will adapt accordingly. 
Uh, this will also give us some lovely hooks to uh, further improve performance with generics in the future. Uh, as you can see there, we have uh, currently uh, a new package called the register package, uh, which has a whole litany of different uh, registration functions in order to register your do funds with Beam so that they can be efficiently used by your various workers, uh, separated between uh, structural do funds there and uh, arbitrary functions. Uh, uh, currently, there's no generic variadic types, so we have to uh, separate everything out by uh, arity count, as you can see. And it's a, it, it works a treat. Uh, how important is this, you might ask? Well, uh, fortunately, we now have these load tests to kind of uh, help verify this. Uh, that the, uh, we have a couple different suites uh, over on metrics.apache.beam.org. Uh, including the Pardu, group by key, co-group by key, combine, and side input suites, all specifically for batch at this time. Uh, so that screenshot there is the actual demonstrated benefit of the generics registration on one of the Pardu load tests, uh, improving times from the for the load test specifically from 23 minutes to around seven minutes. Uh, so a significant improvement in performance. Uh, more load tests are going to be coming, and with this we can uh, improve performance a little bit more in earnest because now I can actually see a real comparison with uh, the Java SDK. Uh, since you're curious, I didn't put a screenshot here. Uh, Java is currently performing the best, but what, would you, what else would you expect when it's had quite a bit more man hours put into it? Uh, and uh, with uh, Go coming in second, and then Python. Uh, so. Uh, finally, uh, the last thing I have is kind of a reprise from this morning's keynote that uh, Carrie kind of put in there. Uh, with 240, data flow of Google Cloud Dataflow officially supports the Go SDK. It's now available for general use for both batch processes and streaming processes. Uh, with it's all the various features I've spoken out or put up on slides today. Uh, this has been a long road. Uh, I've been thinking about this ever since I joined the Beam project. Uh, but it has became an inevitable thing uh, once a preview launched for this back in uh, March with version 2.37 of Beam. Uh, if it's not already up there, uh, there will be a post on the Dataflow blog about this uh, shortly to mark the occasion. Uh, and while uh, Daniel, who's not with us in the room today, uh, Danny, Jack, and Ritesh have been doing a lot of work this year uh, to make all of this happen. Open source is more than about uh, one company's contributions. In this case, uh, the company in this case I'm referencing is Google. But uh, it's, it's about more than that. It's about you know kind of everybody. So I would like to extend a very hearty thank you to uh, everyone who put any little tiny effort into the Go SDK, whether it's fixing a test or putting or correcting a typo or adding documentations or other features or transforms. I went back through all the commits to the SDK over the past couple or, or since the last time I gave a talk, and I was actually surprised at the number of. Uh, different con contributors we've received. So I'm sure, sir, sure this is not an entirely complete list, but if you're there, absolutely thank you. Thank you for contributing and making all of this happen. Uh, so I'm about to wind up, really. Uh, what's next is that, uh, uh, yeah, it's still a kind of an exciting time to be part of the Go SDK. Uh, we aren't done yet, not, not nearly. Uh, Work has already begun on the last major bit of parity work between uh, for the SDK uh, to catch up with uh, Java and Python uh, with uh, state and timers. Once we have that, uh, we can begin to build a robust native group into batches transform for all your data batching needs. Uh, we plan on wrapping more transforms from Java and also from Python. I hear run inference is kind of a big deal these days. Uh, with the ability to have these robust transforms in Go, it's possible you all might want to use uh, Go as part of your Python and Java pipelines. So we're hoping to start work on a Go SDK expansion service to enable that. And uh, finally, uh, kind of hope to make the SDK more efficient going forward. Uh, 
making greater strides to catching up and possibly surpassing Java. Uh, we'll be using that to, uh, using generics and other various tricks to uh, make that happen. And after that, who knows? I will probably have some more ideas by then, uh, but this is your project too. I'm sure you have some ideas. Uh, before I wrap up, if you'd like to hear anything more about BeamGo, uh, as I already mentioned, there is a uh, talk on how to write your own native streaming uh, transforms uh, with Danny and Jack tomorrow uh, in room 203. And if you are somehow not tired of hearing me prattle on, I have another talk at noon tomorrow, also in room 203, uh, about uh, uh, testing philosophy, really, uh, for data flow in Be or no, for, for Beam and the Go SDK. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you. I've been Robert Burke, and this has been the State of the Go SDK 2022. If, uh, thank you. <laughs>